Osler-Weber-Rendu syndrome, also known as hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. And this is a autosomal dominant uh, genetic disorder, and it is a predominantly vascular problem. And this disease can be quite troublesome in a lot of aspects. But there's one common thing, and that you have these blood vessels that are dilated and they are known as telangiectasias. Essentially these are small dilated blood vessels and they can appear in various parts of the body but the complication is that they can rupture and when they rupture they can bleed and cause significant problems. Now where are these telangiectasias appearing? Well there's many places that they can appear in a patient with this disease they can appear on the face, the lips, the oral mucosa, and in particular, the ones that are the ones that cause the symptomatology that shows up most of the time are the ones that appear in the nasal mucosa. When they rupture and bleed, you can get severe nosebleeds. And then the ones that appear in the GI mucosa, when they rupture and bleed, you can get GI bleeding. So, 95% of patients with this syndrome have those nasal mucosa telangiectasias rupture and bleed and when that happens you get nosebleeds so this will be very common on a clinical vignette and of course nosebleeds are known as epistaxis and these nosebleeds are recurrent they happen over and over and they can be pretty pretty serious pretty profuse and because the patient loses a lot of blood, they can cause the patient to become anemic. About 20 to 25 percent of patients with this syndrome can have those telangiectasias that are in the GI mucosa rupture and bleed. And when that happens, it of course causes GI bleeding. And sometimes blood in the stool, um, known as melina. Now there's one very important a complication that happens in about 15 to 40 percent of patients and that is known as a pulmonary arteriovenous malformation and this is of course abbreviated PAVM and PAVMs essentially are an abnormal communication between a pulmonary artery and a pulmonary vein. The genetic disorder that causes this causes telangiectasias which are sort of like small versions of AVMs and these pulmonary AVMs are kind of like the large version so it's a kind of related it's just in different parts of the body. Now when these pulmonary AVMs happen they can cause a right to left shunt in the pulmonary uh, circulation and that can cause the symptomatology difficulty breathing, fatigue, cyanosis and it can also result in polycythemia which is an increase in your red blood cell count. And finally one th serious complication that I wanted to mention is that in a small percentage of patients with the syndrome they can develop emboli blood clots and that can progress to cause either a TIA or a full-blown stroke cerebrovascular accident. And diagnosis. Diagnosis is really clinical you have to sort of just look at the symptoms and the physical exam there are some basic tests you can do with CBC because the patient can be anemic uh, because of the recurrent nosebleeds, fecal occult blood test because the patient has GI bleeding, uh, melina. Now there are some very specific tests, some specific genetic testing that can um, target this syndrome and then also an angiography and what that is is a test that allows you to visualize the inside 
or the lumen of the blood vessels. Now in terms of treatment, treatment is really symptomatic, meaning you treat each thing. So to treat the anemia, you would give either blood transfusions or give something to help build the red blood cells back, and iron is often used. To treat the telangiectasias that appear all over the um, body, and in particular in the mucosa, that is treated with a laser. And if there are emboli, then you would need to give some anticoagulants, of course. And finally, for those AVMs, arteriovenous malformations, in particular the pulmonary one, that has to be surgically corrected. So now let's take a look at a few vignettes. 20 year old male presents to your office with complaints of recurrent profuse epistaxis. Upon physical exam you notice several small red to violet telangiectatic lesions on his face, lips, oral mucosa, nasal mucosa, tips of his fingers and toes. When questioned further, um, he admits to also experiencing dyspnea and fatigue. He states that he has a relative who has similar symptoms and died of a stroke. You decide to order a CBC and a CT of the chest and head and most likely diagnosis is. Well, the fact that he's got this telangiectasia, recurrent nosebleeds, and a little bit of a family history uh, that has some similarity to um, this disorder, that would point to choice D. Next question. During a periodic physical exam of a 24-year-old man, you note multiple small, red, soft, well-demarcated papules on his lips, as well as his hard palate and tongue. On further questioning, he reports frequent nosebleeds in the early adult years. He recalls that slow appearance of these asymptomatic red papules on his lips since his teen years. He assured that this was something he inherited from his father, since many relatives from his father's side have similar lesions. He's otherwise well, without feelings of fatigue, nausea, or night sweat. The most appropriate next step is, well, uh, he may have some uh, anemia, so a very simple test really is just to do a CBC, and that's choice A. Oftentimes, the, the simplest one is the one to do best. CT is very expensive and uh, probably wouldn't be indicated at this time. And finally, 23-year-old female presents with recurrent unprovoked epistaxis. The patient's mother is known to have hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Contrast echo is recommended to screen for which of the following frequently associated conditions. So they're asking, in this disorder, this syndrome, what is uh, some um, serious complication? And choice D, the pulmonary arteriovenous malformation. And that, of course, can be detected by doing an echocardiogram. 